I've decided to do something of a lecture series regarding philosophy, uh, so this, I guess, will serve as an introduction to the series. Um, what I'm going to try and do and, and show is how you can integrate objectivism, uh, the theories of Est, and solipsism. Sounds like a challenge, but it actually isn't. Uh, objectivism, if you know anything about it, it's the philosophy that was invented by Ayn Rand. Uh, it's actually the most recent one I learned of. Objectivism starts from certain basic premises, that reality exists and that we have the tools to perceive it and to act accordingly. Uh, that we can identify and interpret. Uh, there doesn't seem anything radical or revolutionary about that, except that it counteracts certain aspects of uh, a sort of nihilistic solipsism, which they give solipsism a bad rap. Solipsism by itself doesn't have to be nihilistic. I became a solipsist by accident. Uh, the happened during college, during um, my <laughs> third attempt at my bachelor's degree. I was uh, going to Woodbury College, it no longer exists, but I was pre-law, and I'd taken a philosophy course because I like philosophy. It was actually being taught by Matthew Droney. Um, he's dead now, uh, killed himself back in, ooh, I can't remember exactly. It. I think it might have been 2004 or 2005. Um, he was a smart man. Uh, anyway, came across solipsism and uh, I couldn't argue my way out of it. Uh, what I was saying, solipsism doesn't have to be nihilistic. Uh, during that time I had to work with solipsism because I was stuck in it um, and I created for myself a worldview that made solipsism uh, empowering, uh, integrated more with S, the idea that you are personally responsible for everything, and that actually integrates well with objectivism. Um, but S had a different spin, a different viewpoint for the same problem. Um, they took it to a... Uh, yeah, for lack of a better term, like a metaphysical, uh, more psychological level. That you're also responsible for your emotions. You're responsible for the stories you're telling yourself. You are personally responsible. Um, I think my second video is going to delve into that subject. My second video in this philosophy lecture series will delve into that subject. Um, and I'll probably get some hate for that if anyone actually watches it. So anyway, there's these concepts that have been floating around the world for a long time. Uh, in the ether, so to speak. Uh, think of Shakespeare. Uh, Hamlet. There's nothing in this world either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So this is a sort of radical subjectivism, but it's subjectivism on the part of realizing that everything you're perceived is filtered through your mind, through your lens, through your worldview, and therefore you are in control of how you view everything. That does not mean there is no objective reality, such as, uh, as objectivism and Rand talked about, but that there is your interpretation of that reality. And that that, as far as I've read, um, for the majority of her philosophy, at least as far as it is logical, um, it, it follows, so to speak. Uh, Ayn Rand didn't deal with that part as much, the psychological underpinnings. Um, it's one criticism that's been leveled at 
books like Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead, and I think it's a proper objection. I, I love both those books, by the way. Uh, more for the philosophy than the story, although I enjoy the story. Um, I think the way that she interfused, um, yeah, I guess that's the best word, interfused the philosophy into the story worked well and it gave a good grounding in what she, the points she was trying to get across. Um, but the characters are somewhat one-dimensional in that they have a a psychology that she could understand, or at least that she thought she could understand, which I'm not arguing that that wasn't part of it, but there's a deeper level. People don't know how to think. Uh, that's something Werner Erhard, I would argue, um, put forth in S, is that most of the problems people have are a crisis of perception, a crisis of, uh, in how they view the world. And how you view the world is completely up to you. There is, obviously, there are people who are religious, who believe in magic and ghosts and gods and demons and uh, things that have no basis in reality. And if you make your religion well enough, you can integrate it into the lived experience, the reality as it's perceived. And that doesn't change how you can make your own stories. In other words, um, that's the key tenet of S is you are the creator of your story. You're the one that chooses whether it's a tragedy or a uh, comedy. Um, not that those two are mutually exclusive. But my point would be, and what I'm hoping to get across to people in this uh, series, is that you can be happy, but don't expect it to come from without. Happiness comes from within. Wow, man, that was fucking... Yes, don't expect something or someone to give you happiness. Uh, you need to choose the proper world view so that you can view your world in a positive way and experience pleasure from that. Um, if you have the wrong worldview, it doesn't matter what will happen, you will be unhappy. Uh, and I'm afraid that's a lot of people that are unhappy, that's, they're always going to be unhappy because they cannot view the world properly. And properly in this sense does not necessarily mean conforming to reality, but conforming to a worldview that allows you to experience pleasure in life. So I think that's where I'm going to end on that subject for now. This is mainly just an introduction and a quick one at that. I hope you look forward to the next video, which is going to be delving into the subject of personal responsibility, victimhood, and whether it's possible to be a victim without choosing to be a victim, and therefore without participating in the victimization.